Hi everyone, welcome to the Gama Sutra Twitch channel. My name is Brian Francis. Uh, we are here today. You're looking at a black screen. That's not right. We don't start these streams off with a black screen. Alex, why am I starting off with this black screen? Because you, like me, have a sickness. I have a sickness. And the only cure for that sickness is Exapunk! I was going to say Cyberpunk, but yeah, we could do that too. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I'm so sad because on our end we don't get to hear the incredibly good opening yeah. track. Oh yeah, is it playing? Uh, it is. Yeah, yeah I, I get to hear it. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, hello, hi, hello everybody, welcome to the Gamma to Twitch channel. It is Wednesday, the 29th, and we are joined by two very special guests. Uh, very special guests. Would you tell everyone who you are and what you do? I'm Zach Barth. Uh, I'm Matthew Burns. We make games. We make games. Yes. Do you make games, or do you make machines that pretend to be games and have stories in them? So I guess they're games. <laughs> yeah, you could say we make programming environments that pretend to be games. Yeah. So I uh, I don't know where to start with this one. Exapunks. Um, like, well, let's just start on the easy part, right? Like, uh, what is Exapunks, and why did you feel compelled to put it out in this the year of our Lord twenty eighteen? Uh, so, I, sure. I mean, yeah, we, okay. Yeah. Well, um, we've, we've always kind of had this idea of like a, a '90s influenced kind of game in our in our heads. Um, I think Zach, in particular, really kind of in, had this thing that he wanted to get out. That was like something about like hacker culture and and something rooted in in like the stuff that people were talking about in the '90s. Things like. Wired Magazine and um, Hackers the Movie and all that sense that uh, specifically not not just cyberpunk itself but like the idea that things were really changing if you remember the way people were talking in the 90s about like computer technology and how it was going to change the world and things like that so I think the idea for Exapunks at least on like a kind of like a aesthetic level came from wanting to capture that and and capture that energy, I guess, in a way. Yeah. There's a lot of 90s stuff, but like usually it starts and stops at like, whoa, you remember floppy disks? Yeah. Right? And so, like, that's not good enough for me. Um, yeah, definitely wanted to make something that explores it, like, a, on a less shallow level. <laughs> yeah, we didn't want to just, like, like, copy exactly the 90s, but instead we kind of, like, went back to the 90s and sort of tried to think about, like, what the 90s would be like if the 90s were today. Yeah. If that makes sense so it wasn't just a throwback like oh look it's like low res stuff yeah. it's like windows 95 we didn't want, really want to do that so much as we just wanted to like take the attitude of the 90s and like present it and you know yeah i um and, something that might be uh sort of challenging to see in this hour-long stream is that there is this whole game is sort of um steeped in little touches that sort of create uh, a holistic sense of of a different place a different time a different culture um, like when I was going, so like, uh, for everyone who doesn't know, this game is about solving programming puzzles. Um, you sort of solve them by, as Brian is going through them, you try to sort of optimize to see if you can do it as quickly as possible. No. Uh, and like, a, <laughs> no, yeah. there is no quickly as possible happening today. <laughs> yeah, I have a, I have a your, hot tip. Your solution should be quick, but maybe not solving it or maybe yeah. not the solution. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure out the, the logic here. And I have to do that by opening up this zine that you've conveniently provided the game. I didn't print it out, though. Sorry, it's just on my laptop. Um, uh, I guess, would you, why as part of this 90s themed adventure? Oh, nice. we have the zine. It's down there. It's, it's, a, it's a zine. It's filled with stuff inside it's not just information it's information presented in a way that tells a story like the uh like the, the reference i'm gonna find in here like the reference for the programming language looks like it was like photocopied out of like a book yeah so it's like the whoever put together the zine like stole like you know stole the documentation and included it in their magazine yeah it's uh it is sort of like uh, it is such a an interesting and, and, and well executed sort of um, like uh, iteration on what you guys have been doing for years now. I, I this the stream might seem a, a little bit like uh, familiar because it feels like this is so much akin to what you've done before with Shenzhen IO and with TIS 100, but you've really built upon that and refined it. I kind of wanted to, as much as you're comfortable, talk about sort of how your process on this differed and what you learned on those projects and how you applied it here. If that makes sense. Big part of it was, I think a big part of it was research. 
Mm. Um, we did a lot more research for this for this game for Shenzhen IO. We read a lot about um, the city and, and Chinese electronics manufacturing and, and things like that. Um, for this, we really we went all in on like we found old Wired magazines on eBay and, and bought them and went through them. Uh, we got a bunch of old Hacker magazines, 2600, and a, a few others. Got those. Um, did did a whole bunch of like kind of just like immersing ourselves in like ha the hacker culture of the time. Um, Zach went to DEF CON, nice. uh, oh yeah, and spoke with a bunch of people there and sort of absorbed the the hacker ethos, <laughs> the, uh, the hacker mindset, things like that. Um, I think. And we wanted to do something that was like, you know, Shenzhen has the engineering binder, which I think is is great for, for Shenzhen IO and, and really dovetails with that game. And so for this game, we wanted to do something that, again, dovetails with the hacker stuff. So the, the hacker zine is like the, the thing that we, we hit upon. And it has a lot more, it has a lot more attitude uh, than, you know, just a, just a, like an engineering binder. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a uh, punkish outlook on life. It has like fun stories and people write in with letters and things like that. It's it's got a more of a vibrance to it. Um, yeah, than stuff does. There's a real Mondo 2000 vibe to it. Um, it does. Yeah, we got we got some Mondo 2000. <laughs> some of that stuff is a little difficult to read now. Um, <laughs> yeah, just because it's it's so like it's like from a different universe. It's like it's talking like, about bald modems and stuff, and you're like, mm, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> It's Even about, weirder like, stuff. Modems are the relatable part modems, yeah. of yeah. all of that, right? Like yeah. cyber culture, like a lot of the cyber culture stuff just like... It's not applicable anymore. Yeah. People were really, really excited about like cyber sex and like you could have <laughs> sex online. And it was like this new idea and like people wrote reams and reams of words about it. And it's like, you know, almost boring to us today, <laughs> right? To think about that. It's like, of course, people are just going to do whatever online. It's like not even... a a point that you can make. Yeah, it's. I, I de we definitely want to dig into the nuts and bolts and, and talk about uh, the process of, of working through this design and development. So if anyone has any questions um, for these two, please drop them in chat and we'll relay them. But like, honestly, I just want to mention this is maybe the most cyberpunk game I've seen in a long time. And we're, you know, we're talking about a time when Cyberpunk 2077 is splashed across every big event. But this, yes. like, that's about driving cars and shooting guns, and this is about yeah, exactly. like, like... Yeah, so, like, for us, cyberpunk, you know, like, when you say cy I think when you say cyberpunk to people today, most people would be like, yeah, it's like you drive a car and you shoot a gun, and, and there's, like, pink neon... Neuromancer! Yeah, yeah. Like cyber arms, yeah. There's, like, a dark alleyway, and there's pink neon, and it's, like, reflected in the reflection because the alleyway is wet, and then there's, like... The sky looks like a TV tuned to a dead channel. Yeah, <laughs> sex robots everywhere for some reason um so like it's interesting uh cyberpunk the genre we we actually went and we talked to mark laidlaw um the 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 early cyberpunk writer who worked for valve for a long time um and he told us you know cyberpunk is actually rooted in the emphasis is more on the punk part than really the cyber and the, the punk part of it is sort of about being against the system, about like an individual being against the system and fighting the system, and that's sort of where cyberpunk started. It's not about like flashy technology or like some sort of 80s like aesthetic. It's not a visual aesthetic so much as it is about like fighting these massive like corporations and standing up for, for yourself as an individual and, and trying to keep your humanity in a, in a world that's, that's becoming increasingly mechanistic. That kind of stuff. And also just trying to be cool as a writer. And like, trying to be cool, yeah. The, the story yeah. that Mark Laidlaw wrote for the like the cyberpunk anthology from the late 80s has nothing to do with corporations, has nothing to do with people. It's just like, it's just an attitude. And it's like, and the, the way he explained, the thing that I remember from talking to him is ta him saying that like, you know, if, if he could have been in a punk rock band, he would have. But he couldn't play guitar, and he wrote. And so instead, he wrote like the the equivalent, you know, like the the the, the writing equivalent of being in a punk rock band. Mm -hmm. And like, there's kind of just like a yeah, wanting to, to be cool. Was, yeah, was kind of a theme of it. And so yeah, we, that was for me. That, that was a large part of choosing like what to put in exapunks. Is like if it makes me feel cool, go for it. But not in like a like I'm not contemporarily cool and sort of this like pseudo nostalgic. 
it has cool. Yeah, it's upset. It, you know, affects the fun of the cyberpunk. I hope it's because it's about that more than any kind of like aesthetic visual choice, you know, that, that, that it has. That it's about like trying to fight back against the system. Like, yeah, really- I am. Um... I think it's so, I think it's super interesting. There's there's definitely like a there's a strong angle of um, uh, uh, well, like just frankly, if we get far enough, Brian, you're gonna see it. You get to like hack your own body in a way that is, uh, it just seems cool and it just seems cyberpunky in a way that I'm surprised like no one in a in a game I've ever played has ever done before. Um, there's a good question here in chat that kind of fits into this here. Statue Stat wants to know: Is there a particular individual who you think of when you think of cyberpunk and perhaps inspired some of the design? We already talked about. Uh, Mondo and Mark Laidlaw. Is there anything else? Any other inspirations? I mean, there's like the classic. Dave. Dave. <laughs> oh, in, in Hackers? Hackers. <laughs> Hackers the movie. Yeah. Um, kind of was aesthetically. So, so we we all went to Zach's house and we watched Hackers uh, again. multiple times. <laughs> yeah, maybe twice. Um, and I was like, why are we watching this? It's kind of a, not a good movie. But I, I, Zach actually made a good point, which is that Hackers makes it seem cool to be a hacker like like what you're really doing when you're a hacker is kind of being a nerd uh and and like using computers all day but like a nerd at best than an asshole at worst right exactly (laughs) but like hackers the movie actually kind of portrayed hackers as like cool people Mm -hmm. and so that actually was like an inspiration like it's cool to be a hacker like maybe it could be cool yeah yeah like when i was in high school i genuinely wanted to be a hacker and the movie hackers was a large part of it because like if i had just only known real life hackers Mm -hmm. it probably would have been less cool but like that having that aspirational like image just kind of like seared into my mind like it it was real for me yeah yeah i mean there was certainly like uh, an indelible charm in the idea of freaking and you know just like roller skating up to a phone booth and just bringing down the mainframe or whatever they have fashion sense they have like you know they seem it's like a cool like um, multicultural like group of people who are like doing cool things and looking cool while they're doing it and being smart and, being and smart. autonomous yeah yeah and I, I bring it up because not just that, that it, uh, something I enjoy thinking about and talking about but like it does the atmosphere and the vibe in this game makes it feel to me at least more approachable than a lot of what I would consider the hardcore Zachtronics programming games and let's dig into this for a minute um, like it seems like you have almost a cadence at this point where it's you know, you put out like an incredibly challenging, difficult uh, programming game like CIS 100 or Shenzhen IO that's just pure, uh, you know, like language uh, puzzles. And then you come up with something that's a little more approachable for folks like me, like Opus Magnum. This is the first time where I felt like I looked at this game and said, I definitely cannot teach myself to program based on this fake zine. And then I'm already like 10 puzzles in and I'm having a really good and really uh, like brain bending time. So I, I wonder, like, uh, you know, how have you. Like, how have you tried to make this more approachable, if at all, uh, to your audience? Like, is this just for the Zachtronics audience, or are you trying to sort of get out and see, like, a wider chunk? I mean, I would, I would say none of our games are just for, like, an existing audience. Because, mm-hmm. like, we don't really know who our audience is. Like, I, I kind of have an idea, but, like, I don't really know them, right? Yeah. I can think I know them, but, like, I don't really know every person who plays our games. Like, even when people email me, like, that's just a sampling. So I don't think we like try to think about like just making a game that hits these people because like our audience changes, what they like changes. We just try to make a game and then put it out there. And I think that like for for me like when choosing like what to focus on, right? I mean cuz like anybody could make any game, right? Like the choices, the question is sort of like, well what do you make and what do you put in it and what do you not put in it and like what decisions do you make? And like that's a, a pro- that's a thing that it changes over time and it's not based on like other people or like doing things that I think they'll like. Like we made Opus Magnum, um, there was a core idea there for the game and it ended up being easier. Mm. It's just, it just was. And like, I guess we could have arbitrarily restricted, restricted it, but it felt arbitrary. I don't like doing stuff that feels arbitrary. So we didn't restrict it. And it ended up being this game that was open and easier to play, you know, less difficult, less arbitrarily difficult as a result. Totally. And as we were designing Exapunks, we sort of had choices and we're like, well, do we want to try to like limit the amount of stuff that you can do to solve a puzzle? Do we, uh, what, and then we're just like, eh, maybe not, not this time. You know, like maybe in this game we'll try something different. You know, it worked well with Opus Magnum. 
Like, let's just make a decision and see what happens. Mm. And we did. And like, I, I think with even with with Exapunk specifically, there's a, a size limit. Like, it, there's a size limit on the, how big your solution can be. But we've tried to dial them in so that they're not restrictive, but they they shut down on like a class of solutions that are very bad from like a, a cycles optimization. Because it turns out that if you give people infinite room to write code, they like the fastest version of that program, at least in the way Exapunk will like is written, will mm -hmm. be a version of the program that just does it like. It does everything explicitly because, like, to do things in a general purpose way is slower, mm -hmm. right? So if you have to loop through, like, a thousand things, it's much faster to do something a thousand times. And, like, that actually gets really out of hand. And so we have, like, a size limit in there right now. And, um, like, we, we intended for it to be something that's not restrictive, but it turns out it's still restrictive. And so now we're taking another look at it, the benefit of early access, I guess. Like, can we make this less restrictive? And... The decision to make the game, our games now, like less restrictive, it's not it's not really like a calculated marketing thing. It's just like, well that it seems like the thing to do. Right? Sure. It, it seems like a like a good design decision for whatever reason. Yeah, I've definitely been at the point where I'm like trying to loop something as simple as movement commands and at that point it just comes like I'm just gonna list everything out and that's probably not yeah. Uh, yeah. the There's ideal way. Thing to do in this game yeah. that you couldn't really do in, in the previous programming games. Yeah, there's a hidden command that makes it easier, which you will learn about in the second issue of the Zine. <laughs> I'm so excited. I, yeah, I uh, I recommend everyone else don't peek ahead because uh, there is some stuff you can dig into in the in the files that is not worth looking at if you're actually invested in seeing the story play out. Um, there's a good question here from Statistat again that I want to sort of throw out. It's not quite tied to this, but it's interesting. Uh, they want to know how you design your puzzles as a team. Is it a group effort? Is it one person coming up with the ideas? Like, how do you how do you come up with these ideas and how do you end up implementing them into the final product? Yeah, so we, we I mean, I guess the reason you're talking to the two of us when we're a five person team is mm -hmm. that like we for, for all the puzzles in, in most of our games for a while now, we're going to do like a, a narrative gameplay tag team thing where like Matthew will come up, like we'll, we'll come up with the idea for the story, Matthew will go off and come up with some like puzzle ideas that are purely narrative, and then like come back with that, and then like all inevitably have some ideas that come from a puzzle standpoint, and we'll come up with a story to like make it work. Uh, there's definitely stuff in this game where it's kind of like, you can tell it's the stuff that's maybe a little bit more awkward in the story is the stuff that was sort of forced in to make a puzzle work, um, versus there's also things that started as a story thing, and then there's a puzzle built around that. And I, I really like that as a puzzle designer because it, it forces me to like create these open-ended puzzles that like already that's my instinct. But if I'm trying to design a puzzle that tells a story, it's you're much less inclined as a designer to be like, oh, well, but I already have this perfect idea for a puzzle where there's only one solution and there's only one way to do it. It's like, no, it's like you said that they're going to, you know, like hack like a, a pizza place. And it's like, so now I have to figure out like, OK, what is a good pizza puzzle that like feels like a pizza system, like mm -hmm. at the right point in the game and like ending? I think you end up with stuff that's like more like realistically open ended. Like it's not like it's 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 not just me who had an idea for a solution and then built a puzzle around it. Yeah, I will. yeah. it's like a team effort, right? Uh, like Zach said, like sometimes he has puzzle, Zach has puzzles that he wants to do, like ideas based on mechanics, and then sometimes it's like. Me just going like, what's what's more '90s than hacking yourself a free pizza, right? From, from a pizza <laughs> with extra like, cheese, with extra cheese on it. Like that's mm -hmm. like the '90s thing I can think of. And then Zach is like, oh, cool. Well, if the pizza parlor were in Exapods, this is probably what it would look like. And then he makes, you know, he makes the puzzle based on that. So it's really a a, a back and forth. Sometimes I, I come up with bad ideas. Zach's like, no, we're not doing that. That's, <laughs> Silly. Or you know the other way around. So we're, we, it's definitely it's a it's a team process. We try to keep this story in mind, and we try to keep the mechanics in mind um, at all times, just to, as we go through. Yeah, as someone who is like a, a total, uh, uh, a totally ignorant, frankly, of most programming and and most um, computer architecture. Like to me, this all just seems like this sort of magical, holistic, uh, like uh, fake computing environment straight out of the '90s. I wonder how much research did you do to actually try and make it something that felt appropriate to the time period like I, I wonder did you did you study POS systems did you dig into like the way they structure their um, data or was it all just like whatever was best for the puzzles I I think that I have the benefit of just being very thoroughly steeped in like 90s tech in like technology including like retro technology like that's it's definitely something I've been into for like the past five years yeah like at least like I have a bunch of old computers that like I guess I'm like a collector of now. Like I, I've I've got all these like weird like hoarding habits now for like things that are nostalgic and like '90s computer technology is the heart of it. So it's it's sort of like a life research kind of thing. I just live it, and then you know it, right? Like 
So can I say this? Zach likes Zach likes to go to like swap meets and stuff, or yeah, or, you know the um, Value Village, which is kind of like our our version of Google. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes he'll just walk into the office with like a fax machine or nice. something. He'll just be like, hey, check this out, and we'll like poke at the fax machine for a while, you know, and it'll just be in our office for a little while, or um, like a like a compact laptop, like a forty laptop or something like that, or a oh, yeah. Laptop. PC, an old Palm Pilot. Yeah. Have, you, have you ever seen? Um, um, you always have like a lot of like fun like stuff. Hey, congratulations! <laughs> nice. Good job. Yeah. How did you do, Brian? Uh, so, yeah, so we have we have like old technology around sometimes. Um, so we definitely like sort of pay attention to how that stuff looks and feels. The way they were designing like buttons and, yeah. and interfaces back then. I, I brought in a lot of stuff specifically for Exapunks. Yeah, that was... so we did that, and then we also read about like the technology back then. If you, you notice that Exapunks is really based on this idea of like these little these exits, right? That, like run around inside networks. And that's yeah. it's based on a real kind of object model of technology that they were really pushing. Oh, really? And, um, like, I guess there's this there was this company called General Magic, which was founded by um, some ex Apple engineers. And they had this whole like new paradigm of computing that they were trying to push, where code could be executed arbitrarily, like on any server or something. You, something you'd have, like it comes from a time when like uh, handheld processors were too power, like too weak to do things. Mm -hmm. And so what they would do is they're like, oh, you'll have this handheld, and then you'll start running a program here, and then it'll like connect over like a cellular modem or something. Your program will transfer to a server where it continues doing work, and then when it's done doing the hard work, it'll download back, and like your program just like pauses and moves and runs and pauses and moves back, and like. What the fuck? Like no one does that. Yeah, it's sort of like, wild. Like it's just completely off of like what what it ended up being. Like like just like a year later, the Palm Pilot came out, and they're just like, no, it's just like a handheld computer. It's simple, and it just like destroyed their company. Basically, they they ended up making OnStar and got bought by GM. Nice. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So I had no idea. Weird alternate way for computers to work. It's sort of it's sort of like an, a big inspiration. Like yeah. so, what if? What if this technology actually caught up and people like programmed these things, these like little self-contained um, things that move around in servers and execute their own arbitrary code? Yeah. Or what if Java was cuter? <laughs> or what if Java was really cuter? It it's kind of based on like Ethereum too, mm -hmm. like the the blockchain that can run arbitrary programs. Oh, God damn it! It's sort of it's sort of based <laughs> on, like on the technology of that. I'm not a I'm not a blockchain mm -hmm. person. But uh, I'm, yep. I'm pretty blockchain. But uh, but the ideas of like some of the computing stuff is kind of baked into this a little bit. That was part of the research too. I've been trying for so long to avoid learning how blockchain works, and I'm just not mm, keep avoiding it. It's following <laughs> me. Um, I want to quickly congratulate Brian for just blowing my scores out of the water on the last uh, challenge. That was incredible. Great job. I was gonna I was gonna use a copy hack to like copy to read my way to the end of the file, and then uh, thanks to. Um, Thanks to Blubberbub and chat, I looked into the zine, found the seek command, and it got a lot easier. Um, yeah. And now that puzzle, it's weird, like, these puzzles start out and they feel so hard, and then once I figure out the solution, I look at the solution, I'm like, that's a really simple solution, which yeah. only terrifies me for what is to come, but, um, <laughs> uh, I, guess, I guess, like, we've, it's been great to talk about, like, what cyberpunk is and how you make it in game form, but I guess, I guess that brings us to the question, like, um... What what's the underlying way that you like get players like this is a programming language it's effectively just a small like localized programming language how did you like narrow that scope in from like obviously the many other programming languages out there like a, a, perhaps someone too ambitious might have tried to make say this is a game where you're using real code to solve these puzzles um, oh, this is yeah that, that, <laughs> this is not that's that an, e an easy thing for us not to do yeah um, just because. I, don't, I, don't, I would say the programming languages in Dactronics games are not meant to be like good programming languages. They're meant to be interesting programming languages, right? Y yeah. They're not trying to solve the same problems that a real programming language is, um, because we're not trying to get like people in, in companies to use them on a day to day basis. Yeah. So a lot of the programming languages choices are kind of made from, I, I kind of want to say like a design standpoint or maybe like even an aesthetic standpoint. Yeah. Um, Zach and, and Keith, our, our other programmer, all over here them having a lot of discussions about what the programming language should be, and a lot of it is around like what would be an interesting uh, 
what would be an interesting attribute for this language to have? What would make working with this language um, you know, interesting, as opposed to like what would be the most functional or the <laughs> easiest thing? We wanted people to be able to just program straightforward. We just give them C Sharp because it's the best programming language that's ever been invented. Wow. Right? And that wouldn't be a game. That would just be like a programming exercise. Mm -hmm. Like it's the other thing about the languages is that they're very much designed for like the hardware that they're running on. Like Shenzhen IO was filled with instructions that were just for fake microcontrollers like controlling electrical circuits. Mm -hmm. And like half of the instructions for X's are specific to the fact that they move around these like little networks and like reproduce and do things. And so it's like it's really designed around that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a good question here from uh, Snow Crash, who wants to know, what are the quirks in this language then? And I sort of want to expand that to a broader question of like, what are some specific examples of, of some of those conversations or some of those questions you've had, Zach, um, of what should be in the language and, and why, like, uh, what defines what should be in the language? And what's a good example of something that maybe wasn't included, even though it was considered? Um, it's we usually build from the ground up. So it's mm -hmm. usually just a question of what do we include? Right, like the, you need like a couple of fundamental things to like get a computer working. So like one of the big ones is like conditionals. You need some way that you can have your computer do something or not do something based on something, like based on like a state or a test or something. And um, in uh, it, it gets kind of <laughs> kind of off into the weeds, but like the yeah. you know, the way we did it in Shenzhen is very different from the way that we do it in Exapunks. And like that was a deliberate choice, right? And then Shenzhen also is very different from TIS 100. And amusingly, both like with Shenzhen IO, when we started working on it, we actually just copied the way that conditional instructions worked out of TIS 100. And then we're just like, we can't ship the same thing again. So we invented something completely new that just sort of organically like grew out of the context of it. Like in in TIS 100, uh, we did a thing where. Um, like you won't, it's it's based on like a, a certain type of computer where you have like a register that can do math called the accumulator, and you can only do it in that one. And um, and so all of the tests are like you define a label, which is a very common thing in, in program in like assembly programming. You define a label, and then if a test is true for the magic accumulator register, then it'll jump to that point. And in, in Shenzhen, it's based on like the idea that you can test something and then set a flag. And then instead of jumping on a per line basis, you can turn stuff on or off based on the result of that test. Mm -hmm. And like, it's kind of all the same. Like there's, there's not that many ways to build a computer, but like they're two very different models. And in fact, like if you look at like the history of processors, like some like usually processors do the first thing that we did in TIS 100. Uh, people have frequently tried to make processors that use the second thing, like ARM supported conditional execution, and like PowerPC might have, um, or like Xeon, like some of the Intel server processors. Uh, mm -hmm. It fails in real life because it's really hard to write compilers for, but that doesn't matter because no one's writing a compiler for this. So it just becomes like, oh, here's an interesting like thing that like a person who likes who's interested in programming just for programming's sake will find to be like an interesting choice and it it actually really like to one person these are all games about like fake programming right but like to somebody who's paying attention like they're actually they have a very different feel and when you start using these tools like you have to like you have to every time you play one of these games if the tools are different enough you have to relearn how to solve problems using that language and so exapunks again like we we started with shenzhen's approach we were like, no, this is too samey, and like we tried to tweak it a little bit, but it was actually just confusing. And then we actually ended up going to something that's like kind of a third new kind of thing, where like you can do tests, and it sets like a test register, and then you can um, you can jump based on the result of that test register. And so to me, this is sort of like based on like the x86 processor, which making a game that's about like the fake 90s, having it be like a fake x86 architecture seemed kind of appropriate. Um, will anybody get that when they play it? Probably not. Like it's not really that much like x86, but like. It, it comes from somewhere and it, it has like because we we drew inspiration from these real things like it it picks up like these little hidden details and texture which like even though someone can't identify where it came from i think that people who are playing the games and are savvy about the genre can tell that it's different and it's different because it comes from like a real place that's different like it's not all made up bullshit it's like made up bullshit based on like like based something that based on reality, which was also made up, but like for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And so it just has like the, the taste of something that's real, but even if you can't quite pin down why. Yeah, but there's there's lots of room to build in that in that made up computer, right? I mean, uh, this is both this is beyond Brian and I, but I believe there's some form of like uh, editing suite of tools at some point. There's Redshift, I think, where you oh, can sort of. Chatter talking yeah. about that and what they're using to, to make. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. you can see some incredible stuff on the Reddit already. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and what the what the limitations are on that? Yeah, well, so the, the Redshift is a, it's a, like a virtual, I remember they call them, like a... Fictional game Fictional, console. yeah, like a fictional game console that exists within the universe of Exapunks, where uh, it uses the Exapunks programming language that you use to solve puzzles as the starting point, and then creates like a little... Um, like a little game programming environment based around those tools. And so one of the big things about Exapunks is that you program little, like, Exas, which are these little, like, not like robots, but like little, like, entities that move around. And so when it came time to design the red, the, like, the, the Redshift, uh, for me, the obvious thing was, oh, each one of your Exas is a sprite. Right, and so it's sort of like a really like like overly literal. Matthew thinks this is the funniest thing, like an overly literal version of like Unity, where yeah. everything in Unity is an entity, and like we've taken that to the extreme that they are all these like horribly limited, like really frustrating, almost frustrating to program sometimes, like entities. Yeah. And it's like Unity to the extreme if it was invented in like the very the like late '80s, early '90s. Yeah. And it like it's really deeply steeped in like all of the stuff that we created for like the rest of the game, and it just kind of like all locks together. Like we took the tools that we had made for one purpose and then repurposed them for something that like I think makes it pretty plausible for making games. I also yeah. think the Redshift is really funny because it is it's it's it is it's a little bit like a parody of Unity the way Unity works. Um, you'll see these Redshift games that people make, which are very impressive. And mm -hmm. it's like every, you know, every bullet is an Exa, right? I, I, like, it, it spawns an Exa when you when you fire a bullet, and then it, like, kills the Exa when the bullet has to be killed. It is it is kind of like how, if you've played around with Unity, that, that's sort of, sort of the model that it, that it uses. And it, yeah. so, to me, it's like, it, I don't know, it's just like funny on its own as like an architecture. Yeah, I was sort of I was sort of building towards the, uh, talking about fantasy consoles in general. There's a good question here in chat from S Windrunner who wants to know since playing around in Redshift has got them excited about uh, playing around in like sort of bigger, broader fantasy consoles. Like, have you ever tried anything like TIC eighty or Pico eight? And if so, um, sort of how, how does that influence your work? And also, like, honestly, how far are we from you just building one of those? No, <laughs> <laughs> no. I, mean, I, I like Pico eight stuff. Um, I know we we check out Pico eight things kind of um, I, we've talked we've talked about it like it just I, uses lua like if you're just going to use a real programming language to write a game just use unity and make an actual game I, <laughs> some of us think it's point, cute yeah i think it's like you know part of the reason why the redshift is fun is because it's so limited it's so crazily like limited of doing anything at all and it is it's sort of impressive on its own mm. so i think that like yeah mm. making a making a console where that you know where the the aim is to actually build like really impressive games in it is a, is a little bit of a different space. Yeah. All right, so the like the a lot of the fantasy consoles feel like they're designed to make it like easy to make games, and that's not what real like. So there's this book called <laughs> Racing the Beam. Is that what it's called? Yeah. We have it on your shelf somewhere. It's it's about like uh, the people who programmed the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, and it gets like it, it's it's a it's an okay book. Like it, it dives in sporadically into the technical details of like. It was a very quirky machine. It was meant to make Pong, like Pong clones. But like these programmers, like they took these tools that they were given to them not to be easy to use, but just they just existed. Like some like monstrous person made this thing. And they're like, here, make a game that's not Pong for it. And these programmers, they, they like dove in, they fully understood everything it did. And they started like coming up with hacks to make it do like things it was never meant to do. And so I think a lot of the fantasy consoles are made to like make it easy to make games like the redshift is not made for you to make games on it like the redshift just exists and if you can like if you can make a game for it that like takes what it's good at and like tries to avoid the stuff it's bad at and make a game with it like that's the challenge mm -hmm. and like i would never make a game that was just that because that is not a game for many people right but yeah. for some people like some people really truly get it like the redshift um so, so like if you look at like a Nintendo, uh, it usually like like consoles like that have a facility for drawing backgrounds and a, a facility for drawing sprites in the foreground. And so your backgrounds are like you can cover the whole screen, but you have to use tiles and it's mostly static. And then the sprites can move around and do anything, but you only have a couple of them. And yeah. so a lot of like if you had like an arbitrary game idea, you'd need to rely on some mix of you know backgrounds and sprites, maybe just backgrounds, maybe just sprites somewhere. You know, like you use some mix. The Redshift does not have backgrounds. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's 3D, it has like red-blue 3D, and the, the trick that we use to make that work, like backgrounds don't really work with that, so it's just sprites. 
And so some people have tried to be like, oh, like, I, I want to make tic-tac-toe. That's an easy game. And it's like, you, you actually can't make tic-tac-toe very well for the redshift because, like, you kind of want, like, background sprite, like, something where you can just draw and cover the whole screen arbitrarily. And it's like, no, like, you can't make a game like that. But somebody made asteroids, and it's like, yes, that's perfect. And, like, the fact that, like, asteroids, when you shoot them, they break into two smaller ones is perfect because, like, one of the things that, like, these, these like, X's are really good at doing is they can just make a copy of themselves. And so you can totally make a copy of yourself and then become smaller and like that's like it works like it, 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 it It's a game that like like not that this person designed asteroids But like they, they chose something to make that like really played to the strengths of the technology and like that Like that's what programming the redshift is about and that's why like it only in my mind It only works inside of this game. That's already legitimized this language. It's like no like the exaprogramming language is real. Here's like a whole game that like makes you feel like it's real. And then in the context of believing that's real, this fake console in there seems like ex more acceptable in my mind. Yeah, I think if the redshift just existed on its own, like if that was just like, <laughs> here, here's here's this weird thing, like I don't think anybody would yeah. be as, like, The design decisions would be insane. Like yeah. why would you make that if you wanted to enable people to make games? Like, yeah. Hmm. yeah, that Asteroids one is really good. Um, someone made a video poker. <clears throat> One, oh yeah, that's really that was good. a hard. That was somebody choosing a like a hard problem to solve, and yeah. they managed to do it despite it. That like was the, really good. Um, what's the good, good I just want to say, uh, it's, not, it's not a time. I made one that was okay. I made yeah. the, the we we called it like a pack in title and launched it on Twitter. <laughs> nice, uh, Brian. I want you to know that I did the exact same thing. I absolutely messed up the one and negative one things, and I'm pretty sure on this puzzle I also used the wrong values. Like instead of using one twenty one and fifty one, I used or I did use that, so don't do not do that. Um, but uh, yeah, no, this is, uh, I think what's so interesting about these games is it seems like with every release, you come closer and closer to creating a game which perfectly um, like uh, celebrates and resonates with the thrill of solving a problem, if that makes sense. Like the idea of like, uh, that there's that moment when you are solving, whether it's um, an Opus Magnum puzzle or, this, or uh, a challenge here where you go, oh, like you stare at it long enough and then you go, oh, I get it. And then you, you put in the right code and it runs fine. Um, I, I wonder, like, how how have you learned to sort of chop off the bits of the game that don't that aren't conducive to that feeling, and sort of focus in on what exactly it is that you are trying to really celebrate about the act of programming? We we cut we don't cut a ton. Um, we we cut puzzles that aren't working out. We usually maybe maybe like fifteen percent of the puzzles don't make it into the final product. But like from a feature perspective. Most of it is is built in a kind of an additive way, and we just we just try not to go too far. Yeah, try to keep the game. I mean, we try to we we try to get a game out like at least once a year, right? Which means you have to keep your scope down and like focus on the stuff that matters. And I think that being forcing yourself to focus on the stuff that matters makes you think about what matters, right? And like you can kind of tell if you do it enough. Like you, every every game we launch is an experiment where we get to see like let's try to do some things. Okay, which of these things mattered? Which of these things like did people like? You, you kind of learn from it whether you hope to or not. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a super good question in chat here that I almost missed from Popper Sloppin. I I think sorry, which wants to know uh, did X's have any features at one point in development that didn't make it into the final game? Oh, although it's early access, so I mean, um, we're not changing that. Yeah, that that's oh, yeah. the part that's pretty locked in. Um, not really. I mean, like we we changed the way that conditional instructions worked, but that's like a <laughs> like a very like specific tech. Like that's almost more of like a programming language detail than like an exit detail. Like the overall like moving. I think very early on when we didn't know what this game was really about, there were sort of questions of like, should X's have commands for like scanning their environment and enumerating all of the en like enemy X's and enumerating all of the links and like trying to build like a like kind of like an overwrought robot programming game but like very quickly it was like okay that's just gonna like you solve that problem once and you're good like 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 it's just scanning for enemies like that's not a thing you want to do every time like that's that's not a unique challenge you're not going to feel like you're you're solving a problem when you solve the same problem over and over and over again yeah and so that's like the version of like killing other X's that we have now because we want it to feel like sometimes you're doing something that's confrontational but like you just like run the kill instruction and it just like shoots a target right and then we turned it into something that's actually usable from like a like a, a solving problem where like okay it, it shoots an X at random so you don't know who it's going to shoot but like you don't have to mess around with targeting like you don't have to waste time solving that problem you just don't get to solve that problem it's going to shoot something at random which means that like you know like 
you have to use the logic of it to your advantage. Like it'll it'll prioritize your X's over enemy X's, and that means that if you only have one Xa that is yours, you can use it to reliably kill that other one, which means you can use it as like a halting condition where you don't have to tell another Xa to stop, you can just shoot it, right? And you can do all yep. sorts of stuff like based on that, and like that becomes something that like is an interesting, you know, is an interesting space to solve problems. And so like that kind of answers your other question too, that like that's just instinct, I guess, at that point, knowing that, like, okay, we could make a game where you're constantly scanning for enemies and writing, like, a shitty AI every time, but, like, my instincts tell me that that is not going to be an interesting game. It's not going to give you the thrill of solving problems every time. Yeah. Yeah, this stuff does really well with another question here from Captain Kraft wants to know, do you try to design for allowing players to discover interesting ways of solving problems? And how often do those things happen by coincidence? So, for example, do you ever think of, uh, or are there registers that are being used in ways you weren't intended for? So generally, yes, like all of our stuff, like, and I think that's one of the benefits of drawing inspiration from real life is like, you just add stuff without a good reason to add it. Right. And as long as it like fits into your tool set in like a nice orthogonal, useful way, like players will find something to do with it. Um, I think some of these are really obvious to see, like we always sort of intend, like there's a thing, I don't know if you guys have figured it out yet, but like, say you're doing a countdown, what you can do is you can put your counting value in X and then you subtract one from it and test it and say like, you know, does this, is, is X now zero or whatever. But, um, and when you do the test, it puts a value into the T register based on the result of the test. You can also just write your value, like your counter value into the T register and you just count down and eventually it'll hit zero and hitting zero is the same as testing something and having it be false, mm. which means that you can actually skip the test entirely and just in, only use one register instead of two. And so that's something like, as, as people who are familiar with architectures, that's a thing that we dilute, like we made that choice knowing that it would be possible to do that and, and just kind of like made it so it worked out that way. So that was something that's like a clever thing that we kind of intended for, but like we didn't go like out of our, like we intended for it to happen only knowing that that's a side effect of making architectural choices like this, that that will happen. So like we got a little bit of a head start on knowing what you could do with it, like, but it's still kind of an emergent thing. Um, there are other cases, like all of our puzzles are designed like really, I try to design puzzles without a solution in mind. I just try to design something that's like an interesting setup, like an interesting prompt. It's like a writing prompt. Like when you're writing a writing prompt, you don't want to make it so specific that like it's horribly limiting and not open-ended. You just try to present somebody like, here's something that's more of like a, a thing that gets you started rather than a thing that helps you shut it down. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating to watch Brian solve this in real time. And by the way, uh, he deserves a round of applause for trying to play this game live while talking. <laughs> um, chat, but... chat, I just want to say, chat, you guys could have totally made fun of me this whole time and you didn't, and you've been very helpful. Uh, <laughs> Y'all are great. But yeah, like, so uh, close. Uh, like, this is just like, oh, uh, like, I, uh, like, I want to nest my loops, but I can't. Try, try taking that 51 to 50. And like, why well, solve this with two X's? I don't know if that will be easier for you or not. I definitely found it easy, but yours, I think, might be more efficient i don't know um but it's interesting to see someone else try to work through the same problem and right immediately you begin to see like uh what's so exciting about the possibility space of a, of a puzzle like this like there's no one solution right and zach you talked about this at gdc this year um on stage with uh guy Mr. Zone, chris graft uh you also mentioned that uh you are shooting to try and uh, get to two games a year uh how is that how is that going I don't think that's possible at this rate. It's, it's really fast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like we can kind of do like nine or ten months for a game. Mm -hmm. Six months is like a little like there's 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 a, be too fast. It turns out that there's a lot of like a you need a little bit of time like like for your games ideas to simmer. It's also like there's there's work you have to do to launch a game that despite having done it so many times is not getting easier. Like I still have to like find people to email and like fill out all the fucking information on the Steam page and make a trailer. You can't launch a game without making a trailer. And it's hmm. like, I, I can't make two trailers a year and like, and make games also. And like, yeah, like some of that stuff just doesn't press down. Time yeah. Time it's so it's maybe slightly unrealistic to want, but I still want to make two games a year. Like we've got so many game ideas and like, I don't know how much longer we can do this. So, yeah. like, <laughs> I think I think the two games a year thing was more of an ideal. Yeah, than it it's is an aspiration. <laughs> yeah, <Yeah>. goals. <laughs> I, mean, a, I have a question about about sort of like how that affects your revenue, right? Because uh, from the outside, it would almost seem as though you were if you were constantly pumping out games that that are um, different and in many ways iterative, but also like sort of of a kind. It would seem that you would sort of start to see diminishing returns. Has that has that been the case at all, or, or do you do you seem like does each one affect like a different niche? It's going okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll take it. Uh, I, don't, I don't like. I, I like. I said before. Like, I don't really know who buys our games. I don't really know why. 
right? Like, I can, I, I'm paying attention to all the information I have coming in, but, like, at the end of the day, like, I mean, like, you can look at, like, the, the stats of how many copies of our games are sold. Like, there are way more copies going out to people than I get emails, right? Like, if I got 100,000 emails about Opus Magnum, like, I would be screwed. Like, I you know, I would never see the end of my inbox, but that's not the case. Like, I hear from a very small number of people, like, yeah, I don't, I don't really have full data on, like, I guess I guess we had, like, collected if we were evil, but, like, on, like, how many people own, like, more than one of our games and how, like, I just don't know. Like, people, we make them and ho I hope that people buy them. Mm. That is, there is, there are so many books about marketing that would just, just, uh, yeah, I, that's, that's much different than what we hear from a lot of people in indie, in indie dev who these days are like really paying attention to their marketing budgets, their performance indicators, like who they put their games in front of and how, because it's so hard to sell a game these days, right? Especially if you don't have an established audience, um, which like I, you know, I, 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 I feel like we've talked about this before, but I just, I get may as well ask, like, how do you feel about the state of selling indie games these days? Has it gotten any weirder since the last time we talked? Is it, is it harder or easier? Uh, we talk about hard. this a lot. Yeah, but yeah. it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to make any general statements, really. Mm -hmm. You know, especially from, especially from our perspective, we only know the thing that we've done, and and we definitely like hear. You know, we talk to other developers and, and we hear what they're saying, um, but it's hard to like just say very generally like this is this is the way things are because everyone is in such different situations. I would I, I kind of you know I, every time I see like someone you know uh, like a like an op-ed on, on Gamma Sutra or like um, people just on on Twitter talking about things. There's always such a like a, a sense of like this is the way it is for everyone, and I, I don't think that's really the case. Like different strategies work for different people, um, and I think it's like constantly comparing yourself to others is um, not necessarily. You know, there's diminishing return when you when you do that. Yeah, um, we talk about this a lot in in writing too, in the writing world, where it's like, you know, you want to be a writer. Should you write this kind of novel or should you write that kind of novel? Should you be pitching this? Should you be pitching that? Like what's the you know what's the right thing to do and the the answer you know I think writing is, a, is an older field but the answer is like it's hard to find out what you're all about if you're constantly just like paying attention to to others and like oh well this writer got an advance for this and, and that writer sold the you know a million copies of that book like you kind of have to like decide that other stuff doesn't really have much to do with you and the thing that you're doing and the success that you want to have in the way that you want to get that success right so um, yeah it's it's really yeah i I'm, I'm trying to like not say like it's like this for indie developers as much because it's very easy to say that and i think that there's just so much variation in the market now it's so big there's people in all kinds of different situations and um my you know my message now i, I think if someone were to ask me is like you just have to figure it out for yourself because you have different you know, you have so many different parameters in, in everything that you do in your life that it's, it's just gonna you yeah know, you can come up with a solution that's like specific to you. Totally. That's, no, I mean, oh. as a general rule of thumb, though, like I do not trust people who say that something is true. <laughs> I, I just think in general, so, ever. Like, it's just way too easy to just be like, oh, I made a game and it succeeded, and you just have to do these, this, this, and this, and it's like, or I was like, oh, I made a game and it failed because of this, and it's just like, no one has any idea, like. There's so little data, like it's all anecdotes, and they're not even like good anecdotes, right? It's just like I did this, and then something unrelated happened, and like it must be connected, maybe. Like, I, yeah, I just I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a skeptical person, I guess, but no, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, especially uh, in this business. Brian and I were just talking before we started about how um, it would be challenging to talk about this kind of stuff in the business because, uh, uh, you know, Zachtronics especially seems to fit into a broader category of studios which by intent or by luck have found their way into a, a niche that is sort of sustaining. So I think of Zachtronics, I think of, uh, uh, I think of Watch It Eye, right, with the venture games that they make. I think of the folks that make, uh, or the guy that makes the Vernum, you know, all those games. Like, I think, I think it's 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 really interesting, but ultimately perhaps not that instructive for devs to look at what you guys do because I don't know that anyone else could do it the way uh, Zachtronics does. Although in chat they're mentioning Tomorrow Corporation, which also does some cool stuff with programming games. I'd, uh, I'd, I guess I'd also, I mean, I always feel bad when we when we have to ask in that because like you know, I don't know. Like I love games, I love playing games, I like learning about how games are made. Um, 
like like talking about how they're sold like feels sometimes feels like such an, it's an incidental part to how they're made but at the same time it's it's sort of like the only reason anyone buys any game is because something about how they're made like resonates with them um mm. and and it doesn't take much to convince someone to buy it if it doesn't take a lot to convince someone to buy the game that's that's part of the path to selling the game i don't really know if this is a question just kind of a comment about what it's like why why people are curious like i, I actually like i really sympathize with what zach's saying about like not trusting anyone because like you really can't like even large companies can't do they can't do that they can't listen to their own marketers telling them like hey here's why dragon age sold a million copies and yeah. whether they say it's because people love shipping the characters or that people or they ignore the fact that people love shipping the characters neither is true because the reality is like dragon age sold a million copies because it was blasted out with 200 million dollars of marketing and of on store shelves released at the right time people like fantasy like there's too many reasons to stay at once i guess to communicate yeah. to, th there's too much to communicate to another human being yeah it's impossible to be like really scientific about it because there's just too many variables not even really scientific people aren't remotely scientific like yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> people are pretending to be scientific by like look chart you know and it's like yeah i, I think that no one knows what's going on because yeah like you said there's just too many things going on no one knows why anything is happening <laughs> And just things happen to people. But don't stop writing about it. If you're on GauntlessTitcher.com, write all your blogs about it. We want yeah. to hear all your formula, all your postmortems. We want, to, we want all of that. I, I think it's more like, I think the challenge for developers then is not so much that like they need like they need the methods or the tools that the developers had. It's that they, they sort of need to know, like to be able to look at their own processes and modify them, I guess. Like, like, like it's not like they need scientific data. It's that they need... Like, knowing how their developers are selling their games helps you, I don't know, figure out what you've got and sell it. Like, yeah, convince yeah. someone, yeah. I don't know, I like, this isn't really like a good... Like, hearing other stories is super important. I mean, yeah. we definitely want to do that. But it's it's the it's the generalization that where, where it, kind of, it kind of loses me, for sure. Yeah. So let's let's step away from the general to the specific. We got about ten minutes left. So if anyone has any burning questions, please paste them in. There was one like really specific question that I thought was kind of a fun one that I'm going to go back to here. It's uh, C H Pion wanted to know: uh, Did you ever think about a way to allow replicating exas that use code from a different exa? So, for example, Repl exa name instead of Repl mark. Oh no. I took a reason. <laughs> it was always so that was one thing that hasn't changed. Like it was always like so on, on Unix there systems, there's like a command called fork, mm -hmm. which takes a process and just like makes a copy of it, but they both like are running at the same place, which mm -hmm. to me is like the craziest way that like you would start another process is by like completely cloning it and then having them pick up at the same place and it's just like one has a flag that says I'm the parent and one has a flag that says I'm the child. Yeah. And that's just like, ever since I learned about that in college, I'm just like, wow, like that is the craziest design decision, which is perfect for a game about like made up programming. <laughs> and so in, in the original version of, of Exa of programming, you would call fork and then it would set like the T register to one or zero, but then you'd almost always do a test and jump after. So I just like to make the language like simpler and more straightforward, just kind of rolled all that together. And that's why it is the way it is. Uh, I have to ask before we go, how surreal is this game? Because uh, it's just starting out, I'm a few puzzles in. I've gotten to, I've passed this puzzle to Bryant's on, and that's basically it. But it's already clear to me that like, um, there's a lot more depth to this game than I than you can see from the start. And I sort of wonder like, um, what keeps you from making a game that can itself be reprogrammed within the game to be a different game? You know what I mean? Like, I, I almost feel like this could progress to the point where I am beginning to sort of like write code for the options screen or write code for something else. That's, like, well, so, so there's a question, uh, how, how we make games fast. And it's because we yeah. make players, uh, we make our own players code the rest of the game for us. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is yep. not true at all. That's a yep. joke. That is a joke. Uh, <laughs> no, like our, our because I, I think we're actually really far from that. And I think that's why our games are good. Mm. Right. There's lots of games that have like modding support, like um, uh, like space engineers. Like you can just like jam like C sharp code in there and like automate all your stuff. But like it's not really a puzzle. It's just like you go. Someone goes through the effort of writing code because they need their spaceship to do something. And then like 90 percent of people just go copy that code. Ninety nine percent. I don't know. Like you just copy somebody else's code and run it because you're not going to do it. Right. And like that's uh, and, and so we've actually talked a lot about this, like me and the other programmer here, like if we're going to make games about programming, we have to kind of have like at least like a working theory for how they work. 
Uh, so we differentiate between games about like programming, with programming as a means to an end, and games that are about programming as like the means in itself, and like as the goal, and programming for programming's sake. And so I think like games for like space engineers, you can program in it, but I don't really consider them programming games because like you're just programming as a way to achieve something that has value to you, like in the reward system of the game. Mm -hmm. Versus in our games, like if you don't want to program, do not play Exapunks. Like. I don't want to tell people not to play Exapunks, but it's really all about programming. But like, it's about programming in a way where like, we want programming to be like, to be like the main character, to be like front and center, to be the th activity that's fun and engaging and always fresh and always rewarding. And so we design a game that's just like about programming for its own sake. Like, and that's all the decisions we make. That's why we would never use an off-the-shelf programming language mm -hmm. because like, it's not going to be for programming its sake if we do that. Yeah, it's, it feels like um, it's a difference between like, a, and I've never thought of these terms before, but a sandbox programming game versus like a puzzle programming game. The idea being like uh, a game where you just have the freedom to sort of code what you need or want rather like a game that is designed specifically to give you the thrill of successfully programming your way through a challenge. Visual Studio is like a sandbox programming yeah, game. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, like, <laughs> at some point, like, why not just fire up Unity yourself and yeah. then just get to it? Um, the point yeah, of our games is very much the challenge. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so uh, there are a bunch more questions in here, more probably than we'll have time for. Brian, we've sort of been nattering on. Did you have any uh, burning no. uh, phage-related questions? No. I mean, we can talk a, a little bit about the how how we make games fast, right? That's yeah, please. Yeah, that's a lot. I think. Um, I, yeah, I can answer that from like a technical perspective. So, like, we we reuse our engine every time. So that makes it easy. Um, it's a custom engine, so it has all of our stuff in it, and we know how to do stuff with it, and we don't waste time like trying to upgrade our games to the latest version of Unity. Um, we uh, what they're else? They're all we 2D. They're yeah, all 2D that games, helps. You know, with the exception of Infinite Factory, like all all of the, the most recent games have been in, in 2D, and that that's saves a ton of time. I um, I have. Oh, I was gonna say I I stay away from trying to do stuff that I don't understand. Mm. Right, like I, I don't like as a general rule. I guess not like as like a rule rule, but like in, in practice, um, like I, I don't really set out to make a game where I can't imagine the whole process from start to finish. Like we've started projects where I'm like, well, we'll figure those details out later, and very quickly it's just like, no, I can't see to the end of this. Like we're not going to do this. Like I don't, I don't, you know, like if I, if I could, if I wanted to do this, like, I'd be able to see the whole thing through in my head and know what we're aiming for. Like. Like, we, we can't start working on a game where we don't know how we're going to finish it eventually and, like, just trust in the process enough that we'll figure it out. Like, that takes a long time to do. Like, if you don't know, if you go in doing something and don't know what you're aiming for and what you're doing, like, you're going to waste a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah, I would encourage anyone watching this who didn't see it to go back and also watch the uh, fireside chat uh, Zach did with Chris at GDC earlier this year. There's a lot of uh, sort of similar conversations, and you talk a bit more in depth there about the idea of like producing quickly and sort of copying code from the old stuff and bringing it forward. Um, it, it occurs to me a couple of years ago we talked about CIS 100, and you mentioned your uh, aborted dream of making a game like this just super MMO game, like a just giant open world programming game. I think it was called Second Golden Age or something like that. Oh, um, that wasn't open-ended, but yeah, it was no? a, a very narrative heavy programming, or, you know, engineering game, yeah. Yeah, it feels a long time ago now. Has any of that seeped into this? Does any of that really affect the way you think about games these days? Or have you sort of just some, moved there on? There were some ideas for that that like continued to Oh, the, the workhouse thing. Work. Oh, I guess the, yeah, the intro, of... the intro to the game where you have to like transcribe a receipt to make money for your pay for your medication. That yep. is absolutely a thing we were going to use for like narrative purposes in Second Golden Age. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like that, that the game idea that just keeps on giving. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I can't wait to see uh, what it gives you next, Brian. Did you have any closing comments or thoughts as we sort of wrap this up? Help. No, it's fine. Uh, I I have no idea. I, it's okay. I don't need help. If I need help, I'm going to go look it up and talk to the people who are playing the game. Not, I'm not going to demand the developer solve. Can problem. you imagine how much it would hurt to hack your arm in real time? I'm not going to think too much. We get into that in the story a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Watch out for that. <laughs> There's one where you have to hack your forearm. And the, you know, your, your, our friend Ember 2 is uh, very wry. I don't so know. Like watching, yeah. yeah. I, uh, watch I, I was in the room once when the guy that. who inspired 127 <laughs> hours told his story uh, oh, no. about cutting off his own arm. And he literally knocked someone out just by telling the story. Oh, um, my God. Yeah. Fainted listening to it. So, 
with that cheerful anecdote, uh, <coughs> thank you all for watching the Gama Sutra Twitch channel. Um, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, for our regular viewers, welcome back. For our, for new viewers, uh, we would love it if you click the follow button, because if you do, you'll get notified when this channel goes live. Um, uh, Zach and Matt, thank you so much for joining us. That was a wonderful chat. This is a really cool game. Um, that's kind of all I got. Uh, Alex, is there anything else we need to toss out? Uh, Cyberpunk is dead. Cozy Punk is yeah, in. Yeah, Cozy Punk. I, I'm rocking my Cozy Punk. Yep. Yep. I'm rocking Kitty Punk. I'm gonna go pet yep. my cat. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs> Knit the planet. Bye. Bye. Yeah.